Hi. Uh, today we are pleased to have Mr. David Herson, a famous EB5 immigration lawyer. Uh, you would like to give us a presentation of the new immigration issues. Now, let's welcome Mr. David Herson. Hello, I'm David Herson. I'm an immigration lawyer from Southern California. Our law practice mainly does EB-5 and other business and investment law topics. We have a diverse clientele as well as many different languages within our office. So, for example, for Chinese, we can speak Chinese, write Chinese, all our documents are both English and Chinese. So anyone from China can feel comfortable working with us. And the same goes for Korea and Vietnam. We have teams in our office that do both of those. I'm also an immigrant, so I've been through the process. I understand how it feels and how things work. So we, in our office, do not treat people as a file number, but as people with a wife and children and maybe a cat or a dog. And they're coming to a country they don't understand and don't know the details. So we try to hold their hands and make it as easy as possible for them. Many of them, after they arrive, are going to want other services, landed services, like real estate and so on. And that's where uh, this school will come in and its uh, students and its uh, graduates. So when did I start? I came to the United States in 1980. I've been here for 39 years. I came, I was already a licensed lawyer, and I was sworn into the California bar in front of a U.S. consul outside of the country. Very unusual, but that's, I was ready when I came in. I didn't have to go back to school. I then started working in immigration law, and it evolved till, we'll talk about 1990, when in about June, I was in the Senate visiting with a colleague, and he said there's a committee meeting going on of the judiciary, and they're discussing something called EB-5. So we went in, and there you found Senator Kennedy, now deceased, and former Vice President Biden, and they were debating whether or not to have EB-5. Well, we all know that EB-5 passed, and it was passed from um, late November 1990. So my part is that early January or late January of 1991, I filed one of the very first EB-5 cases in the country. And going on from there, I've been very active in making representations to congressmen and senators in the White House, to writing articles, to giving speeches, to being published in different um, top-level law books. And my life has been immigration with this focus on EB-5. So about 10 years ago, EB-5 became much more popular. And as you know, the quota for China was reached so that China EB-5 cases are a little delayed. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm a certified specialist in immigration and nationality law. And that program for the State Bar of California started in 1990. And I've been recertified every year since the beginning. So I've got a long history of certification. I was also chair of the State Bar of California International Law Section, which also has as a subsection immigration, and I chaired various immigration bar associations like AILA, that's AILA, American Immigration Lawyers Association of Southern California, I was the chair many years ago, and I have been involved in all of the aspects of immigration ever since. So, let's move on to the topic of today. The topic of today is called many things. One can be the raising of foreign investment into the United States. Uh, the other is job creation. The other is an alternate method of financing a project, particularly some years ago when the banks did not give loans very easily. It has improved some, but some of the projects do better by using EB-5 money. And the projects can range from housing to high-rise buildings to hospitals, um, medical centers, 
uh, mixed use. Uh, I think I mentioned residential. So you can have anything across the board, and that's real estate, which the people in China generally like. They like to have an underpinning real estate. There are also various factories, research and development, uh, product sales, all kinds of things that all will fit into the EB-5 program. The basis of the EB-5 program is that at least 10 empl employees are created. Now, in 1990, when they passed that law, the employees had to be hired and on payroll for 35 hours a week. They had to be legal, and they could only be U.S. citizens or green card holders. The family of the EB-5 investor did not count towards the 10. Uh, this went very slowly from a support point of view because uh, it was difficult to get 10 workers on an investment of 500,000 US dollars. So in 1992, Congress passed the regional center, then called pilot program. What this did was it changed the EB-5 hiring directly on payroll to being able to use the expenses, the income, and all the aspects of the project using an economist and various multiplier programs to create the impact of jobs in the area by virtue of the investment that went in. So that's also worked very well and slowly the program got busier and busier to the point where the 10,000 visas that are permitted ran out and China who were giving us 80, around about 80% 80 of all EV5s got pushed into a waiting line because the other countries were only in the mid to low hundreds. So you can see that China is far ahead and the major investor in this program. We are hoping that the visa numbers get increased or there's a new way of counting them because we have a problem at the moment. You're given 10,000 visas and not 10,000 projects or investors because every family member, the spouse, and any children unmarried and under 21 who are company, each take up a visa. So on average, you have three to 3.5 people for each project. In reality, you're getting about 3,000, maybe 3,500 actual project investors each year. This is stifling on the program. We're hoping that it will change and we're working very hard to get it changed. Um, let me move on to the basis of the program. Um, basically, when it started, invest $500,000, create 10 jobs, do some management in the operation, show the money is totally legal and clean, and um, hire your 10 workers. Well, as I said earlier, this didn't work so well, so they brought in the regional center program, and that got you the indirect employment. Now, to file an EB-5 case, there were three stages. And you can see them on the, uh, you can see them on the slide, where technically the forms are an I-526, that's the starting application. Then you have what is called consular processing, or adjustment of status. And then the third stage is a form I-829 to remove the conditions. So let me give you a little more detail on each of those. I've already mentioned management direct or limited partnership LLC, so that's indirect. You can be as close to passive in these investments as you want, so you don't even have to live near the project. And if you get the correct permit, you can actually be out of the country while you're waiting for your final, final full green card. But don't stay out beyond six months or you'll have trouble. And if you do stay out beyond one year, expect immigration or the border, Customs and Border Patrol at the airport to take your green card away. You don't want that. You work too hard for it, you wait too long for it, you pay too much for the investment. Look after your green card. Follow the rules. So stage one. This is the processing of the immigrant petition with the U.S. Immigration Service. They will look at the source of funds very, very closely. That is the most critical part of doing your EB-5. That is the investor's real, real responsibility. Prove the money's clean, where it came from, and how it got there, the path of that money, all the way to the escrow or to the project. Very, very important. Um, the project needs to qualify, but that's usually basic, because if you're in one of the regional center type projects, particularly if our office hasn't looked at it, then the documentation will qualify. 
Um, and then the regional centre itself has to be active and uh, qualified as well, and this is basically some due diligence. You hear the word due diligence, that means you check every aspect to see it's real and that there's nobody fooling you. Now we know there have been a couple of bad cases, but when you look at the program as a whole with billions of US dollars coming in and hundreds and thousands of jobs being created, the very few, maybe 5% of the whole program that's gone bad has given it a reputation. Don't listen to that bad reputation. Do your due diligence, work with people who know what they're doing, and you will be guided correctly. And then it's an excellent program. The second stage, once the first stage I-526 is approved, is that you will um, either, if you're in China as an example, go to the US consulate. The way the US government works, they only appoint one consul, so everyone goes to Guangzhou. The other is if you're in the US in a legal status, not a visitor, that's a very difficult one to work with, but if you're in a legal status, like a student or an H-1B or one of those visas, then we can do your adjustment of status in the country, so you don't have to travel back to China, and you don't have to go through an interview at a US consul, which we all know is not a fun thing. It's very intense, and if we can do something that makes it easier for you, we do. So that is the adjustment of status. Currently, most of my filed adjustment of status cases, the green card arrives in the mail. There are a few that go to an interview. And the interview is in the US, and we as attorneys, if you choose to hire us, are allowed to come accompany you. Whereas in front of a US consul, you are literally on your own. If you have a problem, we can only follow up afterwards with limited um, access to the consuls. Once you get that I-526, you arrive in the US. You've got a six-month window. It's a permanent resident visa valid for six months. You must arrive within the six months. The principal must come with the family or before the family. The family cannot travel before the principal investor. Don't get caught up in that problem. Your family will get sent home and you've got to bring them in later. Um, make sure you're in within the six months. And then you can see what you want to do from there. Knowing this, that the date of adjustment of status or the date you enter the US begins a two-year conditional resident status. That two-year status allows you to be treated as any other green card holder, working, traveling, whatever you want to do. Watch out for being out of the country too long. We've mentioned that. And then you look at um, in the 21st month, and not later than the 24th month of your conditional residence, you must file your third stage form I-829, which is the application to remove the condition. Now, that application is critical, less from the investor standpoint, more from the project and the regional center, because they have to certify and prove that the construction or whatever the basis of that economist report has been fulfilled, the assumptions are confirmed, and the other part is that your money has not been paid back to you. You can get a return on your investment, which means dividend payments or preferred payments, but you cannot get a return of your investment until all things work out and the conditional residence is approved. Now, for all countries, the following is the current timeline. I-526 probably takes you a month or two to get it ready for us to deal with. Then you go on to filing that I-526, which is taking about 14 months of immigration, at which point it'll take six months or so before it goes to the US consul. All other countries will then find very soon after that it goes out to the consuls in those countries, and they go for their interviews, and they come in, as I said earlier. For China, you also have to wait for a visa number to be available. And that's where the high number of Chinese investors has, have come in and have forced the backlog or the queue waiting for visas. When that number comes up, then you go for your interview in Guangzhou and you're fine. Problem in the US, if your US status student or H-1B or whatever expires, you can have a problem because you have to be in good status at the time you were allowed to file that adjustment of status. So for everyone except Chinese, 
soon as we get the approval, if they have a good visa, then they go to adjustment of status. For Chinese, we have to wait again for the numbers. If you still have a good visa, we do the adjustment of status. Uh, just as a side issue, five years later, after, after you've uh, obtained your conditional residence, as right at the beginning, you can apply for a U.S. passport. That's going to require that you're in the country for the right amount of time, which is effectively 30 months out of 60, and that you pass some English reading, writing tests, and some uh, informational his history governance type w working. Now, people don't understand, and I need to show you for sure, conditional residence, two years of conditional residence, two years of waiting for the condition to be removed. When that condition is removed, you've almost completed your whole five years. So you can just about then move forward with your citizenship if that's what you choose to do and you are otherwise qualified. Um, once you reach the conditional resident stage and we file it, you get a receipt with your old green card and the receipt and your passport. You continue to travel as if your status is still good under conditional residence. So now we'll go to the next slide and show you a couple of things that are just of interest very quickly. 526s are being um, adjudicated, cases filed before September 29, 2015. So there's your almost 18 months of wait. The IA29s, as you can see, October 12, 2014, is about 28 months. That's so a long time to wait for that stage. In a stakeholders meeting the other day, the government said they are hiring more people and specifically will add to the I-829 team so we can expect things to move along a little faster. We'll just have to monitor that and see how that goes. And finally, the I-924 just generally doesn't matter to regular investors, but to the project owners. And that's where you either get your regional center approved or you make changes. And that's taking 17 months. And that's a very long time to wait. So moving on to the next uh, slide, we have um, an idea. You've heard of so many cases are denied, things are bad. Not true. The program is not bad. Look at these statistics. Um, from 2011 to 2016, the I-526, approximately 10% were denied. What does that mean? 90% were approved. You need to understand that. So of the 10% denied, generally, they were with people who started their own businesses or worked with a lawyer who didn't know the law properly. Most regional center project cases do go through the system, sometimes delayed with requests or appeals and that, but we have a 99.9% success rate on 526s. Then we go to the IA29. People say, well, we'll never get our IA29 approved. This is not a great project, one thing and another. Have a look at that. Approximately 1% of the cases filed have been denied. Very small amount. So you needn't worry about that. Now, you've all heard of a man by the name of Donald Trump. He's the 45th President of the United States. And he has a particular viewpoint on immigration. So when he got into his office, he sent out an executive order that stopped seven countries from coming in and specifically stopped Syrian refugees. Well, everybody ran into court and Mr. Trump lost. So he reworded his executive order and he sent it out again. I can tell you last night, which is the 15th of um, March 2017, two courts ordered the program stopped. So once again, Mr. Trump has lost the battle for this. He has been screaming about it all of yesterday and today. And he says he'll take it all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, this is part of his prerogative. And it also shows how this country has a system of balances that if the president does the wrong thing, the courts can come in. If the Congress does the wrong thing, the president can stop them all the courts can come in. So you've got this balance of authority. So you won't have one person becoming a dictator. Very useful, very helpful, a wonderful country to live in. Due process, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, 
things that you don't realize until you get here. And then when you use it and have it, you become spoiled because it's just there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I immigrated to this country in 1980, and I've been here ever since, practicing law. And I've seen so many kinds of cases and so many events. This is a wonderful country. So moving on with the um, executive order, just very briefly, uh, the second order dropped Iraq as a country, so it became six countries, and still kept Syria as no refugees. Again, as I said, court order stopped that. So then we go on to, um, one more please. The Syrian refugees can't come in. And that's for a fixed period of time, we don't know how long. All the others, there's only a 90 day ban. So it's not that terrible, but people are reacting very strongly that it's inappropriate. So the other thing I get asked a lot, specifically from Chinese, is there are quite a few Chinese Muslims, and they are worried that they'll be blocked from coming into the country purely because they're Muslim. And the answer is definitely not. Chinese Muslims are as free as anyone else with the right paperwork coming to the country, so please don't worry about that. And the same applies to most other countries, not in the top six, or in the uh, suspected six. If you have a visa, or you're a green card holder, or you're now a US citizen, no matter what your religion, unless you're a criminal and have some problem under US immigration laws, you will come in. You will not be stopped by these executive orders. People are terrified of them. They're not so bad to most people. They affect some, as bad as we feel the order is. Understand, most people are not affected. Um, can we go to the next one, please? One of the things that has become a program for a lot of Chinese and others is that a mother gets pregnant in China, comes over here, and has a baby. Well, if you tell the consul in advance and you show you've paid or will be paying and have the resources to pay all the expenses, it's not a problem. People are scared of it, so they hide it away. But then they do something worse. They rely on government assistance to pay for the birth. That has a very serious effect with Mr. Trump or not with Mr. Trump. You've now received some form of aid from the US government and you as parents can be blocked from the country. Your child is still a US citizen, but you're not gonna come here for 21 years? Not a good idea. Pay your way. You'll be welcomed. Okay, some of the changes we're expecting in the new laws are that the um, Price for EB-5 is going to go up. I was telling people in China two weeks ago that it will be 800000 for the $500,000 level and $1.2 million for the $1 million level. However, there was a congressional hearing in the House last Monday, and the way it was presented, it seems that the USCIS regulation, which is pending for comment, will attract a much higher basic amount, namely one point two five million for the five hundred thousand and one point eight million for the one million. So we're not sure. We know a change is coming, a price rise is coming, we do not know when. Advice from our office, while we can't guarantee it, we recommend that you file your case completely to get your receipt before April twenty eighth and thereby try to lock in the five hundred thousand level or if you're the higher level, the million dollar level. That is the way you should be going. Um, other things in the law is the targeted employment areas are getting a new definition. That's highly technical, but it affects which areas can use the lower amount. And they're going to require a lot more reporting, transparency, and openness, which is excellent for the investors because people aren't going to be hiding what they, they've done with the money. They have to have it open and clear. Uh, next, please. A very quick point. If you, as a Chinese investor or any other country in any category, are married to someone from a different country, if you get an approved immigration case for yourself and your numbers are way, way backed up, but the category for your spouse is not, you use a cross-chargeability and you can come in on the earlier 
um, visa date. So, example, if a Chinese person marries someone from Hong Kong, Macau, or uh, Taiwan, they can pick up the dates for those three entities, which is current, which means they're going to jump to the head of the line of the other Chinese that are waiting. Okay, thank you. People are worried about their children aging out. This is an ongoing problem. I don't have a full answer for you, but I can say this. If you file the case around about the child's 16th birthday as it stands today, that child should be okay when the parents get their green cards. I then asked, well, can't we file the child's case now? Up until a while ago, I was filing 16-year-olds. However, the new laws in their draft forms specifically mention 18 years. So I don't want your case to come up in two years' time when the examiners say, well, it's 18 years, your case is no, no good. So I'm advising people to wait for the kids to be 18, and then they can file, or you can file with them for their own cases. Um, next one, please. And I've touched on why you should invest sooner. One, you get your priority date. Two, hopefully you'll lock in the target employment area. That's the higher or lower investment amount. And three, you'll lock in the actual uh, dollar amount of the investment. 